that manages all aspects of the commercialization of technologies developed at UT Knoxville, UT Institute of Agriculture, UT Chattanooga, UT Space Institute, and the Graduate School of Medicine. She then earned a PhD in particle physics during her graduate and then postdoctoral research at the SOAC National Accelerator Laboratory in Menlo Park, California. Let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Mahathir Mahathir. Classes, you'll have to go between this and uh, your spring break, so try and keep it entertaining, though it is probably one of the most boring topics uh, I can ever listen to. So, I'll be talking about intellectual property, basics of intellectual property, and uh, customer discovery. Just a quick show of hands how many are undergraduate students? All right. And then the rest of you are graduate students? So intellectual property, um, and most of you all have to go off and work in industry, so it's a good thing to, for you all to at least understand what does IP really mean and how does it impact. But also as an engineer, when you're trying to come up with something, you want to have utility. You want to have something that a customer will actually use and make use of. Um, and so the whole process of you know, understanding that so you make a product that somebody actually wants and then you can file for intellectual property and get it protected. So please stop me if you have any questions, uh, we can move on. So the topic will really be a one-on-one on IP and customer discovery. So let's do a very quick one-on-one on intellectual property. So first of all, you have to understand the difference between what constitutes an invention and what constitutes discovery. So for example, there are something that aluminum was discovered in 1854. It formed part of the periodic, it is part of the periodic table, but that's a discovery. It's a naturally occurring element that somebody found, and that was a discovery. And it was almost a hundred years later when people actually realized how to use aluminum to make things that are useful, right? So they started making stuff like, I mean, pretty much anything you see around you has aluminum in it, like window frames and you. Uh, utensils and sail masks has a huge amount of application for aluminum and the same thing goes to the theory of lacing that Einstein discovered um, in 1917. In fact, a quick fun fact, Einstein did not win his Nobel Prize for the theory of relativity, which is what he's so famous for. He actually won it for the theory of lasers, which actually goes back to quantum mechanics, which actually he could not agree to to begin with. More of a side show than you ever wanted to know, but I'm a physics nerd. Um, and so when Einstein basically came up with the two different quantized states and the, the, that you can excite these, uh, these photons to a given state and then when you de-excite them all together in a stimulated form, you will have stimulated emissions, which we then call lasers. That was the theory he proposed. He won a Nobel Prize for it because that is a fundamental theory. It's a theory. You can win Nobel Prizes if it's really outstanding and groundbreaking. But it was almost 43 years later when the very first ruby days laser, which can actually be used, was put into place. A reduction to practice, which somebody can actually take a laser and do something with it, that was actually a work of a PhD student, who then also won a Nobel Prize for that, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and so sometimes things take quite some time between having a discovery or coming up with a fundamental invention or thinking of an idea and it becoming an invention that you can actually put your arms around and IP can be formed. So another example of whether something is an invention or a discovery is Louis Pasteur. The story goes that Louis Pasteur, as many of you may know about pasteurization, Louis Pasteur um, was a great chemist uh, and he was working in his lab and he was giving lectures. So one day a student of his came up and his student uh, he was in France, and a student came up and said, my dad has a brewery, which makes wine, uh, not a brewery, so it's a wine-making uh, place, and you know what, half the time the wine just gets spoiled and he has to throw them all away. So he's losing a lot of money in the process of making wine. Now the process of making wine has been known since years, 400 BC, so you, know, you go back to the Roman era. But he always got, there is a reason why half the wine just gets spoiled. So Louis Pasteur goes with his student to the student's father's factory 
and he has this big vat that the vine is getting spoiled. He picks it up and he smells it, and he goes and he smells where the vine is doing fine, and he goes, the way it is fermenting, it stinks. And the other place where everything is going fine, it smells okay. So he takes samples from those two. He goes back to his lab, he analyzes and tries to understand what causes the whole process of fermentation to actually go wrong. It is when you had the yeast not growing fast enough and when you have the bacteria growing faster than that and it kills it and it overtakes the whole process. And from that, he figured out how you can actually slow down the growth of bacteria, have the growth of yeast going fine enough to have consistent production of wine. And that led to pretty much him saving billions of dollars in the wine and beer industry, uh, the cheese industry of France, it's a huge billion dollar industry of French exports that happens every year. And that is nothing but something started off with the fundamental research and understanding, then led to an invention, and that has tremendous amount of applications. The process of fermentation today, even today, has a lot of applications in a whole variety of industries. And so that became a huge biotech innovation. So what started off as him trying to solve a very important problem of saving his wine. Okay? All right, so what is intellectual property? If you have an idea, that doesn't really, you know, that's not an intellectual property. You can't really protect it with anything else but a confidentiality agreement. So you have an idea of going to Mars, and you think, okay, I'm going to come up with this rocket, and I'm going to go to Mars. Great, that's an idea. You cannot do much with it. Now, if you say that that is an idea to go to Mars and I'm going to have a rocket and that rocket is going to have this particular propulsion system and this is how the propulsion system is going to be based, you start sketching it and drawing it and understanding how the different propulsion system is going to take you from Earth all the way to Mars and bring you back, and you start breaking it down into steps, then you have something just more of a reduction and then you will have an invention which you can protect either through patents, copyright, Trademarks are trade secrets, know-how, and you also have materials, but let's, let's leave that for now. So different forms in which you can protect an intellectual property, but you cannot really protect an idea. So just because you have an idea of something, try and reduce it a bit more, and then file for protection before you start sharing, sharing it with your friends. Okay? So what are the different kinds of protection that you can apply for? Um, so let's start off with trademark. How many of you know what a trademark is? Now you, you, I'll ask you what patents. Just uh, So trademark. Come on, people. Yes. Trademark is done in the uh, state logo of a design that actually ties the product. Very good. And some of the famous trademark? Come on, you'll have UT. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> the power T. The power T is a trademark for the University of Tennessee. It protects, it is a branding that the UT, the big orange UT that you have, is a trademark for this, for the University of Tennessee. You cannot just have and sell shirts just because you're a UT student with a nice UT logo and start selling it. Let me tell you, the general counsel will come after you and ask you to stop doing that. Because that is a trademark, that is branding. And as long as it is policed, it will protect the brand. It's really used for marketing of a product. Another one is the Starbucks logo, right? No matter where you see it, even if you can't read it, the moment you see the Starbucks logo, you know there's a Starbucks. And so that is, and so what they do is, and companies will fight, if they are, there have been cases where you have similar Starbucks logos and Starbucks will stop you and will go after them no matter how small and in what rural place it is to prevent that because if they don't, they will lose their trademark. All right, so the next one we will move on to is patents. Anybody want to patent this? No? Yes. I have one good student here. Well, it's, it's uh... I'll just say it's, the, it's like a job you can actually let say a government, a government know about the idea of the work. Okay. And what you're trying to protect so that it's kind of registered and no one else can offer you to say that. 
close. Good. A pr idea a patent protects an innovation once it is given to you. It is for 20 years. And for the government for giving you a limited monopoly, which is really what it is, the government actually issues you a limited monopoly and a patent right is actually given to you by our constitution. It is in, it is in the original constitution that every person has a right to the, their invention and to a patent. And that gives you the right to protect others from making, using or selling. Copyright. Come on. I'm pretty sure most of you engineers, electrical engineers are doing a lot of this one. Code, anything you'll write, anything you write becomes copywritten and it is yours. Okay, the moment you write something new, you write the next song of Let It Go, or whatever that is, I don't want to think about it because I have a new version of that movie coming out. Um, if you write that song, then that song or that code belongs to you, the author, okay? And then that goes for the life of the author plus another 70 years. And that is why companies like Disney, when they have all these Disney movies and all these Disney um, songs, it is owned by Disney. So as long as Disney continues to exist, songs like Let It Go cannot be pl played without paying Disney a royalty. Okay? And this prevents others from copying. So if you have singers singing music and you're trying to make a rap or something else, you cannot just mix and match things without getting permission from the author because that is what protected by copyright law. And last but not the least is trade secret. Come on, trade secret. Very good, Coca-Cola. And essentially trade secrets protect, it's, as long as you keep it a secret, it remains your protection forever. But you have to do everything to document that it is being kept a secret. So the Coca-Cola recipe, which goes back close to more than 100 years, is a sugary syrup recipe. And there are only two people in this whole world who knows what the Coca-Cola recipe is. And the reason being is that one person dies, the other person still knows about it. And it is kept in a separate, uh, in a special vault, and it's kept locked up. In fact, Coca-Cola will make all its recipes and its syrups in one location, and then they'll send it out everywhere else to change everything else depending on the taste of the, look, uh, the general population. So if you were to drink the same Coca-Cola drink uh, in India, it is going to taste different than what it tastes here, largely because Indians like the drink to be a bit more sweeter. Um, so that is really, that differences can happen, but the original syrup recipe is kept a secret. And as long as they do everything to keep it and to protect it, um, it, it can be kept forever. And if somebody were to steal that, they can go after them and actually get life imprisonment for, because the whole business of Coca-Cola really depends on them keeping the recipe a secret. Okay, so we'll focus primarily on patents because that is a lot of what we see here. Um, and so a patent, as we mentioned, actually gives somebody, uh, gives you the right to exclude others from making, using, selling, offering for sale, or importing an invention. So essentially, it's a document that gives you a limited monopoly to prevent others from practicing your invention. A patent never gives you the right to practice your own invention. It just gives you the right to prevent others from practicing it. So it's an exclusionary right, okay? So what does that really mean? So let's imagine uh, we are back in the caveman day era, so there is really, you know, everything is open game as far as invention is concerned. And we have a very fancy patent office. And so you have a caveman who's watching, you know, you have to go to the river every time, go and fill up the bucket of water and come back home. And he goes, you, know, you have to go to the river to do something and you come back and you go, this is so tedious. What if I came back, came up with a bucket? This way I can at least transport a limited quantity of water from the river to my house. And he applies for a bucket because this is brand new back in the caveman days, and he gets a patent for a bucket. Great. Caveman B sees that idea and he goes, oh, that is pretty smart. Guess what? If I put a handle to this bucket, then I can actually transport 10 different buckets at one given time. So he goes ahead and he files because that's a brand new invention. He files for an invention for a patent with a bucket. 
A caveman A has a pattern for a bucket. Caveman B gets a pattern for a bucket with a handle. Caveman B cannot use his own invention because it needs a bucket, which is held by caveman A. Caveman A cannot put a handle anymore on his bucket because the bucket with the handle is held by caveman B. That is what exclusionary principles mean. You can exclude one from doing your invention. So either one, if they have to practice the other one's invention, has to go and get a license. And this is the real reason why you would have companies suing each other, because what they're essentially saying is you've entered my territory without any permission, and so you need to get a license. And the patent is, again, going back, is gives you a limited monopoly. So for a company to protect all its R&D dollars that it has invested, it needs some form of protection, which is why they go for a patent, because they can then keep their competition from practicing that particular invention. <clears throat> so what kinds of things are patentable? Essentially, anything that is touched by man, anything that's man-made. Um, so you can have new chemical compound that doesn't exist in nature, or you can make kits, um, you can have, you know, different materials in the kit as a diet, you, know, you can pretty much anything that is man-made, um, you can come up with a patent for. What you cannot patent is laws of nature. So if you come up with F equals MA, or you come up with um, the next new break, breakdown theory, you can go off and apply for a Nobel Prize, but you're not going to get a patent on it. What you also cannot patent for is naturally occurring DNAs or uh, plant material or unaltered organisms that you find in nature. So anything that is occurring in nature, found in nature, you cannot patent. Anything that's man-made, you can. Now, before to get this limited monopoly, every patent should describe what it's used for. Uh, does it have any use? Does it do what it's supposed to do? Is it a perpetual machine or not? You can't get a patent on a perpetual machine. Is it novel? Has anybody else done something similar to this? Um, have you described the invention well enough that somebody else can, can do this invention after 20 years when the patent is over? Because for giving you this limited monopoly, what you have to do in return is teach the invention so that after 20 years, somebody can actually take it and copy it and do it. And then it also has to be non-obvious, which means if I were to take two different publications and put them together, somebody skilled in the art, would they be able to come up with this invention or not? So you have to, so when you file for a patent application, typically what happens is they will look for all these different criteria and they'll come back saying, oh, it's not novel. So you have to go and explain to them why your idea is novel and why there's nothing out, like this out there. And most of the time they'll come back and say, oh, it's obvious because there are five different publications here and I put them together. Uh, you know, you come up with this and you have to then go back and tell them, no, it's not true because none of these do this or none of your publication you've cited is even relevant, which happens very often. And so there's quite some back and forth that goes on with the patent office till the patents are issued. And what that really means is you get claims that surround your invention and that is your little island. And that is where you have your monopoly for. Okay. So how do you lose patent rights? If you pretty much do, uh, without filing a patent application, if you have a poster presentation, uh, you go and you have an online publication, you have the, you're so excited about your work and you start putting a poster right outside your department, or outside your, your lab, it really doesn't matter that nobody else worked past that lab. The fact that you have done it, and the fact that somebody could have walked past it uh, because it's a public university, it makes it a public uh, disclosure. Um, when you have your PhD thesis, it gets published. You can put a publication bar at the university for a year. Um, so if you do any of this without actually filing for a provisional patent application, then you lose patent rights. Okay? So far so good? All right, so then we move on to copyright. Copyright is essentially applicable, as I said, it's anything that you write. Uh, so you write a code, you write, uh, you draw a, if you're an architect and you come up with a new drawing of a building, um, your publications. That is why when you publish and you send it to an IEEE or some uh, journal, they ask you for your copyright because then the journal can actually take your work and publish it 
But after it's done that and you've assigned your copyright to the journal, you can't even copy your own work because then you're copying the journal's work. And so that is why it also becomes, that is hence you have to cite your references um, because you just cannot go off and copy because it's a vi violation of copyright. Um, and so from there, so when you are starting to, this is especially true um, when you're starting to do open source code. So when you start downloading code and you start writing code and you think you have something new, what is very important is especially when you're looking at open source, the kind of open source that you are downloading. What is the libraries? What are the licenses that you require? And it's not all open sources are created the same. Some open source licenses require anything that you do with your work to also be made open source. Some open source licenses will say, fine, this is open source, but anything that you do, you can keep it proprietary. And some go somewhere in between. Some open source licenses will also say, oh, if you're going to use this, you also have to give patent rights. That gets to be a bit more complicated. Then you have to understand, especially because it's code, and whoever writes the code owns the code, you have to be very careful if you're digging in your friend's code and starting to write new code, do you have rights to your friend's code? So if you go off and you decide to start the next Facebook or next software-based business, be really careful in who writes what, and who's bringing in what, and what you're going to be taking in because he who writes it owns it, generally. And then you have to understand that, is it blocked by some patent? Is there, is there some patent that covers this invention and there is a code, and by using this code, am I going to be infringing on somebody else's patent rights? Or even if I'm taking somebody else's copywritten material, do I have to pay them royalties? Um, and then you have to understand, you know, again, go back to your compiler. What is required? Some things, some licenses are only given to you for academic purposes. You cannot just take that and use it for commercial purposes because you have to go get a different license. That's another thing that you have to go and look at and look at any related patents. So that is really copyright in a nutshell. It is far more complicated to do copyright if it's not done right, to actually understand and take it all apart and understand who wrote when, what, and what's the contribution who came up with derivative rights and um, if you're ever following, there's a huge lawsuit going on between Google and Oracle on fair use. And that is the whole thing on using the Java framework. You know, does it constitute fair use? Uh, one says yes and the other says no. Guess who's saying what? Um, and it's gone all the way up to the United States Supreme Court in trying to figure out did what Google do constitute fair use and if not, what does that mean to all the different um, Android software that is out there. So this is where copyright gets far, far more complicated. So why do you even bother with intellectual property? Largely because it is the only thing that gives you monopoly. It's the only thing that can protect all your years of R&D, can give you some form of way to protect it and to move forward with it. And these are some of the examples of uh, university created intellectual property. Um, and these are all these companies, which you can recognize them, or products. Um, a quick story on Google. You had two Google PhD students, right? Way back when they were doing their PhD at Stanford, came up with an idea on doing quick searching of, uh, on the internet. How do you quickly go and catalog it? How do you do page search, right? And rank them. Um, and it was actually funded under an NSF project. And they came up with it and actually two of them met at a conference uh, where they both happened to talk to each other and go, oh, this is the research you're working on. And, and they continued working on it and they filed an invention disclosure with Stanford and they said, hey, you know, we think we have something here. And Stanford did what all tech transfer universities do. They marketed it to Microsoft, to Netscape, to um, all these different, you know, uh, search engine providers or whatever. And, you know, Yahoo was another one. And all of them came back saying, we are not interested in something like this. Um, and so Stanford didn't really know what to do. And these two guys go back to the Stanford Tech Transfer Office and say, hey, what are you all wanting to do? Did you find a licensee? And they said, you know, there's really nobody interested. And we have filed an application, but we don't know. And they said, do you mind if we formed a startup? I said, sure. 
you may go ahead and form a startup and see how you commercialize it. They formed a startup, uh, started working in, uh, out of a garage of one of another faculty member. And uh, so they started writing a business plan and they needed help. And of course, it's the Bay Area. So they go off and they go, okay, who do we go for help in writing a business plan? And they find this guy and he says, you know, can you write us a business plan? We had the search engine uh, algorithms here. And he says, uh, how much is it? And it was $50,000 to write a business plan. And they go, you know, we don't have that kind of cash. Can we give you some equity in the company? And this guy looks at them and he goes, for this? No, I want cash. And so he lands up, they land up giving him cash. They raise some angel capital uh, from friends and family. They give him the $50 million. He writes in the business plan. And then they try and pitch it. And they could not really pitch it to anybody. Nobody wanted to listen. So they go back to Stanford and they complain. And finally, Stanford's president goes, you know, these two guys are so annoying me. He calls up Sequoia Capital Ventures, where Stanford has quite a bit of endowment money there. And says, do you mind talking to these guys? And the rest is history. Um, in fact, the guy who wrote the business plan, that's what happened to his $50,000. They were going to give him the original owner's shares. So this is why it's a funny story. Um, it's a great story, too. And it started off as google.stanford.edu, and it ne they didn't do a single bit of marketing at all. It was all word of mouth, and it kept going from there. OK, so these are all the different products. Gatorade uh, still today pays royalties to, the, to Florida, largely for the name Gator. So even though the patent on the actual formulation has expired, uh, PepsiCo still has to give quite some royalties to Florida for the use of the name Gator. Okay, so coming up with all of these stories, you know, and you come up and you have this invention and you go, okay, now I have this, so what? The whole point is to understand customer and to do customer discovery. What does customer discovery really mean? What is the biggest unknown for any startup? Anyone? If you are going to form a startup today, or even if you have an invention today, what is the biggest unknown? The customer, people, you got to sell it to somebody. Somebody has to buy these widgets and software and everything else. And so the biggest unknown is really the customer. Top 10 mistakes that, that every startup makes no matter where they are located. And the first thing is to build some, something that nobody cares for. To have a product out there, nobody really Cares. And then there is a team, as you keep hearing, a team is very important. Uh, so having a bad team and then there's lack of focus, people just keep moving around. But the biggest one, by far, that the mistake that a startup makes is building something that nobody really wants. So how do you figure out to build something that somebody actually wants? You are an expert in your idea. What you have to become, and this is true if you're going to go off and work in industry, is to become an expert on who your customer is. What do they want? What do they care for? There is nobody who is more passionate even today about understanding the customer and giving them exactly what they're looking for than Jeff Bezos. In fact, even today, Bezos is known to go in and read customer comments and he will reply to some of them. Because you, if you are going to form a company, you have to be obsessed with what your customer needs and wants. So you, because only then can you tell a compelling story because here's the thing, Newton's first law, law of inertia is very, very true with humans. Nobody likes to change what we are doing. We are all pretty happy doing things the same old way. So if to get me to change the way I'm doing something, you have to make a very compelling story. This is also true for businesses. They'll go, oh, but we have done this. We have these processes locked in place. Why would we change something? Because to change something can lead to things just going all wrong. So you have to be able to understand what your customer wants so they're willing to break the status quo and willing to show you a check. So to create value, you have to understand the customer so your product has a fit. So at the end of the day, you need to have a customer product fit. So. What the customer, the, to do that, you have to first try to understand your customer. You have to understand what the customers are doing every day in their lives, 
What is the same old, same old process? Are they using the same old clunky software? What software are they using? How annoyed are they getting at what they're doing? How much is it slowing them down? So think back before the calculators were invented. Um, and back home in India, you could not use calculators for exams till high school. We have to use log tables. I don't think any of y'all even know what that is, but those are the most awesome, awful, awful things where to sit there and look at those and start adding numbers. By God, to go from there, and I came to this country and everyone was using calculators at high school. It's like, what? That was a pain. It's so painful. So if you had come to in a school back home and I was doing uh, going through 12th grade in India, that would have been a painful process. Just calculating the logs of five different things um, and then adding them up just to multiply three numbers. Really? Um, so describing bad outcome. I, could, I would always make mistakes adding them up. I would lose points just because I couldn't add these damn numbers up. That was the bad outcome for me. See, they didn't try to convince me to buy a calculator, right? Rather than using those awful logbooks. They still give me nightmares. Um, so you're trying to understand what is so bad and it is in adding them and going through those numbers. And that's the biggest obstacle for me to get my job done if that's how I have to still do my work. And so you have to understand again, you say, okay, if you use this calculator, yes, you can't multiply and add numbers as quickly as you could, but you're not going to make mistakes and you're not going to get C in your test. And that would have been a reason to go and buy a calculator. So this, I would have been your customer. You would have sat there, understood my problem. My problem was sitting there and adding log tables and trying to get my numbers right, my physics problems right. And from there you told me, you know, what would happen? I was just making mistakes and adding. And so that was my pain. And your calculator would have been a huge gain in me being able to solve the problem and getting it right. That's a benefit. Okay, so then your calculator would have been a perfect fit, and there's a huge reason why the calculator market is sold uh, in, for high school kids too in this country, I'm realizing, um, largely to get that because then that leads to them going and buying or convincing their parents that if they wanna get an A, you better go buy me this expensive calculator, which then leads to growth in profits, okay? So the only thing that truly ever matters is getting a product market fit. Other than that, really nothing else matters. And then once you get this fit and you understand what your product should look like, if you do this beforehand and you understand what your product should look like, what features it should have, and then you go and design them and apply for a patent and you spend close to $20,000 getting a patent with the USPTO, that patent can now protect your invention and your idea and your startup because you now have something that somebody is willing to go and buy rather than the other way around. So, do companies really make, what do you all think? Do companies really make products that nobody wants? How about, and these are all real products, let's start. An ostrich pillow, all right? Somebody actually made this and tried to sell it. Here's another one, a dog umbrella, all right? There's actually a patent for a dog umbrella. I've yet to see a dog umbrella out in the market. Very cute though. Here you go, pet rock. That's about the only pet that I'm ever going to get my daughter. Um, but that's a pet rock, and somebody actually thought of having a whole business based on this one. Um, so, to conclude, you have fundamental understanding on this side, you know, to go in to understand D, and here is going to be consideration for use. So the more the consideration for use, the more it's utility, the more it is practical, the more it's applied. The more, the higher up it is here, the more it's fundamental research, okay? So, one of the most famous person in this quadrant was Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison, as Corton has said, and he holds a very large number of patents, and he's pretty much said he doesn't want to invent anything that does not sell. This man was obsessed by making things that somebody would want. He did not care for anything else. He just wanted, will a customer buy it? Does it have utility? And if it doesn't, he doesn't want to be bothered with it. The next one on the other end of the quadrant was Neil Bohr, the father of modern quantum mechanics. He really didn't care if you ever have studied quantum mechanics, you really have to understand what is, you go back and really look at you know, quantum tunneling and 
Besides solving all those one to one uh, equations, you don't know, really go, what's the use of all of this? Well, quantum mechanics today is more than a trillion dollars to the US economy, but uh, to the global economy. But way back in the 1900s, when Neil Bohr began formulating the basic theories of uncertainty along with Heisenberg, you know, with, does a particle exist or not? Schrodinger's cat, is the cat here or is the cat not there? Well, if you open the box, you'll know about it. You know, if you think about it that way, you really go, huh? But that is how many, at a very fundamental level, many things can be explained and then there are applications to it. But quantum mechanics by itself, you cannot really, there is not really direct use. And the other side on this quadrant was Louis Pasteur. Pasteur was not only a great researcher, but everything he had also focused on having an application. So this is probably the quadrant up here is where you know, you'll find most people coming from academia will be. And then you really don't want to be in this bottom quadrant where you go, nobody cares, and I have no idea what I'm doing, uh, which is how I felt many a time during my PhD. Okay. So with that, thank you. Thank you for a very, very nice presentation. So is any, does anyone have any questions uh, about this topic and for Dr. Krishna Murphy? Yes. Um, I would like to ask about the international patents. I mean, the United States that are protected is not being used in Europe or somewhere else. So the United States will only give you a patent protection for the United States. It's every government has to issue its monopoly. So you can't bring it into the waters of the United States, okay? So if you want to apply a patent protection in Europe, you have to apply for it in Europe. Now, can some, so if you only apply for a patent in Europe and in, in America, can somebody in China make it? Sure, but they can only sell it, they cannot sell it in the United States or in Europe. They cannot sell, make, or even have it. Um, in fact, there are times when companies have known that their product is going through a harbor and they have a patent protected in this particular country and they know the ship entering the harbor is going to have their um, infringed product, they have had those products thrown into the sea because it entered uh, the waters of a country that you know, they, they had a, a patent on. So it protects you from even entering the waters um, and having trade pass through. But you have to protect it in every country uh, to prevent the use, make, or sell in that particular country. Is that true for uh, the copyright as well? No, because copyright, the moment you've written it, is yours. And it's protected. In fact, the whole world follows the same copyright law. So it is. I'm sorry? You have to enforce it. So you can file for it with the US Patent and Trademark Office and get a copyright registration. Uh, but then, you know, everything is as good as how you enforce it. And you have to prove that it was derivative, and you have to also prove that they actually copied from you. So if you write a code and somebody else goes and writes another code that pretty much does exactly what you're doing in a different language, or you, know, you do it in C and then they go do it in Python and it gets the same end result, that doesn't protect you from that. Mm -hmm. A patent will protect you from the basic idea, the invention. So if you have this idea of going to the moon and this is how your propeller is going to be. That, and this is how you know how you're going to define things. Then nobody else can make that. But if you only have a drawing, so you know, that's it. The only a drawing is protected. So you're saying they could rewrite it. They could rewrite the same algorithm in a different language, and it's still it wouldn't infringe on copyright. Unless you can really prove it, they looked over and they copied on your work, and you know, you've got to really go in there and prove it, but. Would you recommend patenting the algorithm? Or it's really hard to patent an algorithm. It really depends because the US uh, patent law changed uh, because there was a, uh, a lawsuit called the Alice lawsuit, which really stopped uh, patenting on a lot of uh, software base. But if it has an implementation or it does something, you still can come around that. Um, so the whole point is, you know, talk to somebody an IP attorney or someone who can help you with that before you go off on it. Now you can, depending on how you've written the code, keep your code proprietary. And that is why companies like Google, even though they use a whole bunch of open source software, they, off, they offer um, 
software as a service where you only see the interface and all you get is the results. You don't see the back calculation. Um, and that is perfectly a valid business model that Google makes tons of money on uh, and using open source. So yeah, just because it's open source doesn't mean you cannot make money. You can. It's just how you deal with it. I wonder what should we do if we want to get something added and also get something published. Well, um, well I mean, how can we use, uh, arrange the timeline? Oh, you can. You can completely arrange a timeline. You can go and find for a patent application and then go and publish it. No, you just go file for a patent application because then it gives you a timestamp and then your publication doesn't become prior art. Okay. Anything before that timestamp is prior art. Not after. So that's why you should go and file for a patent application. A patent application, not an invention disclosure, a patent application. It has to be stamped with the USPTO. Give you a number. So do you bring your patent when you have say you have an idea or this is already out there? Or do you do you think you most of the step to get the except one? So it's the greater most the same way except what's uh -huh. different because they actually really infringe those. You have to check that. That is what makes it so much harder because you know, are you and what many trolls will do is they'll block something in random spaces, which kind of makes it harder for you to go around. Um, and so yes, and that is why you really have to make sure what is out there uh, to get your rights all cleared up. Yep. Any the question? So actually, I have two questions. Yes. One is like, uh, if I wrote, if I write code when I'm employed, when I'm salary, so does the organization, say UT or a um, other company, own the copyright or I own the copyright? Ah, it depends on when you work, you will sign a whole bunch of contracts. Okay. And that con when you go work with the company, you will sign a whole bunch of contracts. And contracts will pretty much say anything you write will constitute work for hire under the policy or anything you invent and anything you write all belongs to us. And by UT, UT has a policy which says that um, any invention and copy, uh, copyright, copywritten material that you do as a part of your employment or, or using UT resources belongs to the university. Um, so if you do it through the university, you'll find an invention disclosure with us. And if we license it, we share money, 40% of the money back to the inventors. And the company hopefully have a stock option as well. The other question is, yes. like for the like journal publishing industry, uh -huh. Uh -huh. so why why does it end up ended up like uh, asking the authors to relinquish? Because you have it, right? It's your copyright, so they cannot just go and publish. So you relinquish it to them, so they can take your work and publish it. What what did it end up like uh, the author holding the copyright while licensing the, the, the publisher to copy mm -hmm. his work? Why did the, they took the full copyright from? Because the then office. they can do what they want and they can charge you to go there and download the own journal. Okay. Makes sense. Because if you have to, you don't have UT public, uh, UT rights to uh, access IEEE and I go off somewhere else to access IEEE, I have to pay for my own publication. Yes. How do you do that marketing research for disclosing the Ah, so think about Coca Cola, right? They do not have to disclose. What, this, what is in their recipe. But you can pretty much describe what it is. It's a fizzy drink, it is bad for you, it has high sugar, I'm kidding. Um, it's a fizzy drink, it has high caffeine, I don't, you know. And you can describe what it does without having to tell you exactly what the recipe is. So if you go and you are describing, hey, I have something that can do X, Y, and Z, that is a lot different from telling them, oh, by the way, and I have this code that is written, da 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 da. You don't, you don't need to do that. I do not know how, in fact, Google never tells you how it's search engine algorithm. You can go back and try and sort of reverse calculate it, but that's a trade secret. Yes. Correct. So, so you have to show why when something is invented in some other field, um, why that is not obvious to work in your field. So the whole point is to prove it's non-obvious. 
right? So you may say that just because it worked, um, and we are having a case right now where you know we are dealing with flow battery, completely different chemistry, but the examiner is saying, oh, in lithium ions, a completely different chemistry. This is what they do, and you go, wait, you know, just because something works in lithium ion doesn't mean it'll ever work in a flow battery because the whole structure and the chemistry and everything is different. And nowhere do they tell you, teach you in the lithium ion battery that this thing will even work for flow, you know, and there is no reason to believe one will do the other. Now, if there is enough and more literature that showed anything that worked for lithium ion would also work for flow battery, then that's that. Time's almost up. Anyone? Last question? Well, I've never had so many questions before. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, any questions from the online audiences? Okay. All right. So please join me and thank uh, Dr. Mahat. <laughs>